Hey everybody. So, uh, yesterday I was talking about synchronization and how important it is to everything about what it means to be a human and have a mind, have experiences of our own intelligence or to dream, to imagine things, to create. And how synchronization underlies all of these familiar aspects of our human experience and how fundamentally important it is uh, to the capacity to have these experiences coherently. And I also spoke about what happens when uh, the underlying elements that we use to synchronize with become disturbed when desynchronization occurs and how that can produce uncommon mental experience, uncommon metabolic experience, disturb our sleep rhythms, produce unusual or disturbing dreams. Desynchronization is something that a lot of us are learning about right now, firsthand. And it's not the words that matter here. It's, it's the experience of being human. You know, when we have a conversation with each other, we establish rather naturally, usually, and if, we're, if everybody's paying attention, right, we establish a rhythm. And right now there's a rhythm right around me of, of hummingbird vocalizations. And there's a bumblebee flying around. And these plants are growing at a pace. The sun doesn't rise and set in three minutes. If it did, that would really fuck things up. <laughs> Right? <clears throat> I can't even imagine a science fiction scenario in which something like that occurs. So we're, we're surrounded by <clears throat> rhythms that are natural to our experience and to our humanity. And whether or not we recognize all of them isn't really the point. We don't need a list or a catalog. We're fundamentally susceptible to their disruptions. And so when the, when the anchors that are experiences of human synchronization, when they are suspended or appended, when they change or become broken, most of us suffer from that. And it's not too hard to understand why. Imagine trying to dance against three pieces of music, none of which have rhythmic synchrony. Or just imagine trying to dance against a single piece of music to dance to some rhythm other than the music that you're being exposed to, right? You know, when we establish relationships, we develop habits that aren't merely in our minds. Um, we develop habits that become embodied. They become visceral. We no longer have to think about what time to wake up or go to sleep or call our loved ones 
or have a conversation or eat a meal. Synchronization allows us the luxury of handing off some of the stuff that might otherwise have to be consciously done to the subconscious mind, the unconscious mind, our metabolism, the body itself, our, our visceral humanity. And so when the elements that orchestrate our synchrony are disrupted, or when they're mechanized, right, and accelerated consistently over time, as Alvin Toffler foresaw in Future Shock, we suffer. We become confused, disoriented, desynchronized. And when we're in that kind of a situation, it's very difficult to uh, to assemble the faculties with which we might detect and respond to the desynchronization intelligently. Because in fact, part of having faculties depends on synchronization, right? It's like this problem of trying to see with what you see with, or to trying to see what you, <laughs> trying to see that which you see with, yeah? Trying to understand that with which you understand. I can make language right now, but I can't explain in language how it is that I'm able to make language right now. And when we start to think about topics like these, we begin to orbit one of the topics I'd hoped to include in my, in my talk yesterday on synchronization. Feedback. Recursion. One of the most interesting examples in language, which actually represents the collapse of two necessarily distinct orders of... of what? orders of language and consciousness is the Russellian paradox, this statement is false. And if it's true, then it's false. And if it's false, then it's true, which means it's false, right? Now, these paradoxes were originally teaching uh, toys. They weren't meant to remain puzzling. They were meant somewhat like the intellectual analog, partial analog, of a Zen koan. You, you chew on them like a dog chewing on a bone until finally one day it breaks, right? And you have a breakthrough and you understand, oh, now I can see. And I can explain to you uh, the power of the Russellian paradox by carefully examining its structure. And its structure produces feedback, right? If it's true, then it's false. If it's false, then it's true. If it's true, you know, is it true? <laughs> if you ask this question, well, it, it tells you it's false. But if that's true, then it's false, right? It's, there's a feedback mechanism there going, going on. And I, I believe that what we call consciousness, and certainly what we experience as dreaming profoundly involve not only uh, crucial aspects of necessary synchronization, they also involve and can unexpectedly uh, produce or evince feedback. Recursion. Now, to return so that I don't lose my thread, I'll return to the Russellian paradox. This sentence is false, commits an error. And I will create, when I had my breakthrough with this particular paradox, I created a rule 
that preserves intelligence beyond language, that demonstrates why language cannot tell us what it means. There is no language that can tell us what it means. We produce meaning from, rela from purposeful relation with linguistic constructs. And you are doing that right now as you listen to my voice. And I suspect that requires much more than you simply hearing my words. You have to reflect upon them somehow. You have to have some purposeful um, relationship with not merely what I'm saying, but like the thread, right? The, the context of my communication, the purposes it embodies and expresses with your own intelligence, with your own mind, your own history, all of our experience with language has something to do with any experience of language. So there, it's as if there are these, these orders, right, from the tiny to the larger to the really big to the gigantic to the universal of feedback that are going on constantly in our experience of consciousness or awareness or thought or creativity or dreaming. So the Russellian paradox, when I finally had my breakthrough with it, I created a rule and the rule is, no statement shall, by self-reference or other means, collapse the two orders of language and the minds that interpret it into language. Yeah. No statement shall do that. And that helps us understand the power of that paradox to reveal to us that language does not tell us what it means. Minds interpret language, meaning therefrom emerges. Right. Now, there are so many fascinating things that we can talk about about feedback related to feedback and human consciousness, intelligence, creativity. Um, and there's all different kinds of feedback. So there's the kind that you get when you present an idea or, you know, when you write a post or you write a song or an essay or a poem. There's the kind that you get from angry drivers around you when you make a mistake or there's the kind you get when you're these days wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. There's that kind of feedback. But that's not really the kind I'm talking about, even though I think it's relevant. I'm talking about the kind where a stimuli or a stimulus uh, recur in ways that re-include themselves. An example of this in language would be this sentence is about the sentence I am making, right? That's a one phase feedback loop um, <clears throat> where the sentence refers to itself, right? It breaks that rule that I made earlier uh, that comes from my examination of Russell's paradox. And essentially that examination means there shall be two orders, language and the minds that interpret them. Any statement that pretends that there aren't two orders or that language, can, language is the mind with, that interprets language is false. It's not actually, it's not false, it's malformed. It's so badly formed as to not even be wrong. It is incoherent. Yeah, it's an incoherent statement. Now that rule is very tricky. And there's lots of, that's not the end of what you can discover from Russell's paradox. It might be the beginning. But that's the key that unlocks the lock, that opens the door, that leads to the stairwell, that <laughs> takes you to where you yourself must go in person. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> there are experiences of producing kinds of coherent feedback. Um, and by the way, although the brain doesn't have wires, it has nerves. And nerves aren't wires. I want to be really clear about this. Um, but as we understand signal propagation and transmission in the brain, it's a multi-ordinal system 
of very sophisticated feedback loops that reintroduce previously accessed sensory stimuli or signals and continually reintroduce them and process them in ways that differ from the last time they were processed. So that a signal might, a stimuli or a signal might, for example, take four different routes. And the next time it takes those same four routes, but with different end results, because other, other circuits are included on the second pass and so on and so forth. So what we understand of the brain's structure in terms of nerves and signal propagation along neurons profoundly involves feedback. And the corpus callosum, which collect, connects and distinguishes the two uh, cerebral hemispheres, when working well, ensures that we don't end up with a storm of feedback in various physical um, pathways that would result in an epileptic fit. An epileptic fit is essentially a storm of feedback in the brain and the nervous system, and thus the body. Now, there are certain kinds of feedback-like storms humans like quite a lot. Um, one of them we call orgasm. And I would suggest that many of the experiences that we associate with psychedelia involve the chemically, the chemically induced or modulated invocation of specific forms of feedback or um, the result of inhibition in certain aspects of the brain's ordinary feedback systems and feedback control systems that allow it to leak back into our cognitive and perceptual and emotional experience. So feedback's really important. Um, and I'm not going to be able to lay the topic bare today. I just want to introduce it and to add a coda to yesterday's um, video because I intended to introduce it along with synchronization. Surely you can see there's a link between these two topics, right? The topic of synchronization and the topic of feedback. We would understand this immediately if we were studying something like computational neuroscience or cognitive neuroscience because we would see that when you desynchronize certain brain activities signal propagation methods or paths, you get radical, intense, sometimes problematical, sometimes beautiful results. And one of the, this is a factor in our dreaming experience that uh, <clears throat> in hypnogogia, which is between waking and sleeping, if, we're, if we become aware in that, in that phase state, we can have experiences of feedback in consciousness um, and, and in what we might refer to as disembodied consciousness because our bodies are usually uh, paralyzed uh, when, when we are, when, once we fall asleep or when we begin to dream. And also in, in hypnopompic experience, which is the, the gap between um, sleep, dream, and waking. Again, if we are conscious within that uh, experience, we are very likely to encounter the effects of feedback. And in consciousness, feedback is profoundly unusual. The direct experience of feedback, the ordinary experiences of feedback that we're familiar with feel perfectly familiar. Um, that I see the terrain around me and understand it as real, it actually requires feedback to happen. But the kinds of feedback that we're not used to, the kinds that happen in what we refer to as disturbances, mental disturbances, orientation disturbances, um, when we become sick, 
or uh, we have an unusual dreaming experience or we have a psychotic break or we have a sudden unexpected experience of prodigy that is demonstrable or we have it's the ghost of that we have mania right these all involve feedback and although I cannot tell you exactly how each of these experiences involve feedback, it's very important to have a kind of a, a personal familiarity with the fingerprint of feedback phenomenon, right? Now, guitarists learn about this because they, they eventually, electric guitarists, they realize they can, they can take the magnetic pickups in their guitar and they can make a sound and then move the pickup closer and closer to the speaker that is outputting the input from the guitar. And pretty soon this creates a feedback loop and the guitar begins to scream yeah, in a way. Or the, the feedback loop produces this incredibly richly harmonic, high-pitched tone. Similarly, you can point a video camera at a screen that is outputting what the video camera is receiving and you'll get this like extremely profound endless hall of mirrors effect yeah now those are mechanical um instances of feedback but what i'm talking about are both cognitive and relational instances of feedback and in case it isn't clear the thing that attracts humans, that makes them want to have sex with each other, is an experience of feedback. What humans refer to as intercourse is a fundamentally profound layered array of feedback mechanisms. Physical, emotional, imaginal, romantic, cognitive even. Uh, so in case you think like feedback something, you know, that just kind of happens only in machines or whatever, boy, would you have that backwards. The fact that you can be conscious at all is fundamentally dependent on feedback. And when there are desynchronizing inputs or when the inputs that ordinarily synchronize the, the kinds of feedback that, that we are familiar with, when those either change or are disturbed or disappear or are replaced by something else like machines, then the kinds of feedback that we, be, that we are capable of experiencing transform dramatically. And it's extremely difficult to control these things intentionally. In other words, we are primarily subject to feedback in, in the ways that we as humans experience it. And Although we can learn to modify our behaviors and habits in ways that transform some of the elements of synchronization that we're, um, oh gosh, that we're linked up with, <laughs> it's, it's ironic, I'm suffering right now. from the lack of an aspect of intellectual feedback with which I am deeply familiar and upon which I depend. And it's my capacity, my capacity to select the perfect term is slightly off kilter at the moment. But when we so you're actually witnessing a moment of desynchronization and the feedback between the thread of my thoughts and orientation and desire and purpose and my capacity to embody those has been slightly impoverished. 
because when I'm speaking extempore, I'm both experiencing a kind of feedback and sort of writing the feedback I'm experiencing. And if something should disturb or interrupt that process, my capacity to reinitiate it is affected um, to varying degrees, right? From the recoverable to actually it's better that it was, in, you know, from, from a situation where it's better that it was interrupted than if it hadn't been, which does happen, to the recoverable, to the stumbling, um, to the irrecoverable, right? There's like, there's degrees of, of repercussion. <laughs> Much of human understanding, experience, and relation is based upon something very, very primeval that I actually hear going on around me all, all the time right now in the bird songs. It's based on a relational behavior that I'll call, that I, that I will um, term call and response. Yeah. And notice how the machine sounds, which aren't as loud in the recording as they actually are here, um, they tend to override and interfere with the natural signaling of the birds. And of course that isn't merely signaling. Those sounds contain sophisticated information in a way that's not only dissimilar to language, it, there are dimensions in which it supersedes language. It accomplishes something language will never do by itself. And this is part of why I think <laughs> it's easy to forget that the origin of language was in song. But you can hear that I'm not just merely speaking words like this. I am imbuing them with living music. So in a sense, if we are... Um, to the degree that we are able to be musical in speaking, more information is encoded than mere words can convey. And one of the tragic features of being a man is that we are trained to speak in relatively monotonal musics, right? In very modest music. Whereas, you know, the music of women is unbelievably effusive and, right? And it's not just that it has a higher pitch, right? Women are encouraged to use vocal music. Men are largely discouraged. Some of us become singers or poets and we recover some musicality to our voices. Um, but that inclusion of an extra dimension of information, that musical uh, intonation of speech, is profound and incredibly tragic when it is lost. Um, we men, for all our apparent <laughs> desire for primacy and dominance, we suffer severely in all kinds of ways that most of us are trained to become silent about if we are even capable of awareness of them. And that's, you know, that's a kind of feedback between um, gender and culture, right? But that's the other kind of feedback. That's more like the, the, the conversational kind. The call and response that happens in birds informs the entire relational landscape, right? Not just the birds. Where I was going when I desynchronized a little while ago was that synchrony and feedback are important. If the synchrony is what we might refer to as good or rich and coherent, then the kinds of feedback that can emerge from that synchronization will be similar, right? They will be coherent, they will be rich, they'll be accessible. It's like dancing to the music that's actually playing. Now what I want you to try or even try to imagine is I want you to pretend in your mind that you're trying to dance to music that's actually playing 
but you want to desynchronize yourself by about a half a second to a second from the rhythms and the beats so that while the music's actually playing you're dancing too late it's probably almost impossible to do physically it would be astonishing if, if someone sent me a video of them actually succeeding in doing this and you could fake it right you could fake it by listening to music that was slightly desynchronized from the music that was playing in the video yeah and then you would see oh, I should try this that would be crazy that's a great experiment um, so yeah you could have music playing outside your ear and have music playing inside your ear like that's half a second to one second occurring you know that much later and be dancing to the second one while the first one is playing and you would see something that I think is relatively impossible to do except with that mechanical setup which is to dance too late to the music that's actually playing but in our cognitive experience in our dreaming experience sometimes in our emotional experience in our relational experience our vocational experience our social experience in all these domains of our humanity this kind of thing happens all the time and one of the primary um, culprits in that is mechanical signals because we are not machines and signals in nature are almost never mechanically stacked up the way that the signals in machines that we constantly are exposed to are and I believe that those mechanical frequencies disturb our interiority <clears throat> and <clears throat> in, they, <clears throat> they imprint themselves on the character of many of our feedback experiences possibly including things like some of the experiences of people who uh, have been diagnosed with Asperger's or schizophrenia or um, bipolar disorder or uh, manic depressive disorder, uh, borderline personality disorder, so on and so forth. Now, that's a, that's a theory. All I'm saying is that I strongly suspect that our exposure to machines and their rhythms has largely deleterious effects on our organismal and cognitive nature, on the essence of our interiority. And also that it affects the kinds of feedback we are likely to produce and under what situations we're likely to experience those kinds of feedback. But when you've had some, if you've had an experience of psychosis or of schizophrenia or of mania or of depression, then you've had an experience of a fundamental shift in the familiar tone of self-relation that orients your thought, desire, experience, awareness, consciousness, attention, faculties, capacities, abilities, and so on. And it's possible to have non-ordinary experiences that are profoundly beautiful and inspiring and some of us have had some and this is one of the reasons why people are relatively attracted to psychedelics a subject that I consider to be much more dangerous than ordinary people usually think it is um, and as I said, you know, some of the most profound experiences that we have as human beings, the experience of witnessing the birth of our child, the experience of being born, <laughs> um, the experience of becoming severely ill, the experience of falling in love, the experience of um, sexual relation with another human being, the experience of sexual relation with ourselves, the experience of relation with nature or with animals or with pets, all of these involve feedback and it's useful to understand that to be aware of that um, to be sensitive again to the fingerprint mm. 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 
to the fingerprint of feedback. It can help us understand things that are profoundly puzzling, shocking, disturbing, um, unexpected, including our relationship Japanese anemone oh. with ideas particularly in a time like the one we're in presently where people are orienting themselves into us and them groups mm. <laughs> via the exchange of media objects yeah. and media objects have been created for the express purpose of weaponizing our human relationships and our capacity to exchange information and ideas during a crisis. There are enemy forces that, ha that are utilizing the feedback field of social media intentionally to produce both desynchronization and enmity among clades of humans. Hmm. Has no scent. Or I can't, I can't detect the scent is a more accurate statement. So many sages here. Oh, wow. That's incredible. I'm a big fan of sage plants. Mm. I'm not a big fan of much at all. <laughs> I don't like the role of fan. <laughs> kind of into the originator role. Um, to experience one's humanity in nature is to experience an entirely different species and purpose for the production of, of feedback than to be in a city or with machines or, you know, the rhythms of nature resynchronize our bodies. Our bodies have they're, they're, they're vastly more ancient. The rhythms and signals and stimuli available in a living place are a trillion fold, a quadrillion fold more ancient than, any, than, than all of our relationships with objects and representations and machines and ideas and language and so on. So it's profoundly medicinal for those of us who can, who are available to reorientation, yeah, to return to living places and form relationships with the place itself and all of its inhabitants and their relationships because that stuff is older than the idea of time. It's much older than the physical universe. I'm not going to explain how at the moment, but trust me, it's staggeringly older than the physical universe is. And people say, well, you we can't be older than the physical universe. Yes, you can. <laughs> you can have, for one thing, if you measure the age of the physical universe in flat time, 14.5 billion years, you can produce more than that amount of individual time in one year on Earth. Because organisms are to time what stars are to light. And so they are so much older than anything you can imagine. And it's useful to get a direct experience of that. Me talking to you about it is not going to be very helpful. Unless it encourages you to get a direct experience. Yeah. These uh, little jasmine flowers, they really light up this whole area with fragrance. Mm. And 
that's a form of sensory experience and feedback that I just really lights me up. The fragrances of living beings and plants particularly. Certain plants obviously I favor, some I don't much like. Um, the experience of being human is fundamentally relative to the capacity to produce and experience blueberries. No, okay. <laughs> um, feedback. Mm. And when we are deprived of the kinds of feedback that are nurturing and nourishing and encouraging and inspiring socially, intellectually, communally, creatively, physically, um, in our sleep, in our dreaming, in our relationships with food and exercise and sunlight and purpose in our lives, when we are deprived of the, the nourishing inputs, we are inclined to fall into modes of feedback that are both profoundly gravitic in that they keep drawing us back down to sort of a lower or more primitive, undesirable array of behaviors and potentials. And similar, similarly, the opposite is true. When, when those crucial and nourishing and inspiring and rewarding aspects of feedback are present in our lives and minds and relationships and so on, then we rise up and we experience a vastly greater um, uh, scope yeah, of our intrinsic human potential. But this, uh, this first thing, right, the problematical feedback, the suffering that happens when we're entrenched in um, terrible jobs and crappy roles and crude relationships and, and this kind of thing, it leads toward collapse. It leads toward de desynchronization, it leads toward disharmony, it leads toward addiction, it leads to in the direction of mental illness and decoherence. Yeah. So, I want us to become aware of the power of feedback, which happens when we reenact things in cycles, but it's also happening moment to moment in the roots that underlie our capacity for consciousness, awareness, intelligence, meaningful awakeness. And also things like dreaming and imagining and play and um, human eros. Yeah. I just want us to get more familiar with this aspect of our inherent organismal and human nature. And hopefully I'll talk more about this and more meaningfully in an upcoming video. But having failed to introduce the topic last night, Hummingbirds chasing each other around the garden. They're in a, you know, they're in a feedback loop. I, I had intended to introduce this topic yesterday, and so I wanted to at least get a start on it today. Hopefully that you'll find um, something of value in, in this video. And I'm very grateful that you've taken the time to join me and listen. And I look forward to learning together again very soon. Bye-bye for now.